Welcome to our discussion of the Great Depression from 1929 to 1939. This lecture will be divided into three parts. And following our study of the Great Depression, we'll move on in the next module to World War II, where we'll look at the origins of World War II, some, some of the actual fighting itself, and then the most important, the legacy of World War II for the modern world. Now, as we saw in the previous lectures, the 1920s politically in the United States were characterized by a real resurgence of the Republican Party. And as we saw previously, one of the reasons for that is that the liberal progress progressivism of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson had actually achieved most of the major goals, such as vote for women, direct election of U.S. senators, etc. Now, particularly after World War II, even though the excuse me, World War I, even though the United States didn't suffer the number of casualties, near the number of casualties of the major European combatants. Americans were tired of World War II, World War I, and they were particularly tired of Woodrow Wilson and his crusading idealism. You know, that was characterized for many Americans by Wilson's failed attempt to set up an effective League of Nations. And of course, as we saw in the previous lectures, the United States did not join the League of Nations. And many Americans wanted to return to what they considered normal conditions. And this is referred to as normalcy. And this is what many of the Republicans spoke about in the 1920s. Now, over the period of the Republican presidents, there were four very important Supreme Court appointments um, conservative justices nominated by Republican presidents and um, approved by Republican senates. Now, during this period, 1920s, the Supreme Court struck down federal child labor law. Not that this was okay, but they felt that child labor should be dealt with at the state rather than the federal level. They also opposed a minimum wage law for women. <clears throat> now, on the positive side by today's standards, the Republicans reversed Woodrow Wilson's policy of not allowing blacks to apply for jobs in the federal government. Also, as we saw in the previous lecture, the Ku Klux Klan was very, very active in the 1920s with many million members throughout the United States and the Republicans from the president on down vigorously attacked the Ku Klux Klan. Turning briefly to foreign affairs, during the 1920s the U.S. was essentially isolationist. Focus was on normalcy, the consumer culture that we saw before. And during this period also, in addition to being by far the largest industrial power in the United States and a major exporter, the United States was the source of finance capital for many, many corporations and countries around the world. So in essence, the United States became the largest banker in the world. Now in the early 20s, the United States proposed disarmament and there was a widespread belief, not just in the United States, but also in Europe, which we saw had suffered much more from World War I than the United States had, that part of the answer was to reduce the size of the militaries, and that would reduce the incentive to go to war, or if there were another war, it wouldn't be as horrendous as the Great War. So in 1922, the United States joined what was called the Five Power Treaty. And the goal here was to limit the size of navies. And so the United States joined Japan and Britain, in essence, carving up 
the world as to where they would have naval prominence. The United States would be supreme in the Western Hemisphere, Japan in the Western Pacific, and Britain from the North Sea in Northern Europe all the way through the Mediterranean, through the Indian Ocean, and all the way to Singapore. Now let's look briefly at some of the causes of the Great Depression. Since 1924, there have been a great bull market. And you may recall from earlier studies of economics, a bull stock market means the stock market is increasing, and a bear market means it's generally on a decreasing trend. So a bull market since the early mid-1920s, Everybody saw this as a surefire way to earn money. Now, lots of people didn't have the cash to go buy. So we saw in the previous lecture how people received credit to buy products, consumer products, from cars to refrigerators, you name it. And now people were using credit to buy stocks. And this is called buying on the margin. That's an economic term. So let's just assume a share of a company then costs $10. The person may only have a dollar, but a bank would lend them $9. And everybody assumed that stock that was valued $10, the next year would be valued, let's say, $15. So if the person sold that share of stock for $15, they could pay the bank back the $9 and then make some nice profit there. That's called buying on the margin. It's leveraging through loans, which was fine for many people because they felt this bull market was going to last forever. Another problem was consumer spending, although, as we saw in the last lecture, it increased greatly. It wasn't increasing rapidly enough to keep up with all the production from the factories. But at the same time, the stock market continued its upward trend. And the stock market, therefore, was not reflecting the economic fundamentals um, of the companies. And it was, you know, what well, in 1929, I'm sure you've run across this in previous studies. There was the famous crash. The stock market overnight decreased significantly. And it led, the next one, it led to many suicides, people literally jumping out of office buildings from the 15th or 20th floor to commit suicide because many people who had thought they were wealthy realized that they didn't have the money to pay back the credit they'd used to buy their stocks. But it's important to realize the stock market crash in and of itself did not cause the Great Depression. But what it showed was that the prosperity of the 1920s had been based on very weak foundations. Similarly, there was in Florida a, a price bubble for real estate and prices kept going and up, going up and up because wealthy northern people would take the train down to Florida, have beautiful homes to stay in. Um, when it was cold in the north and it was still nice weather in Florida, but those prices went up and up. And then that bubble broke and uh, the, you had a major real estate crisis in Florida, which obviously didn't affect the whole country. Now the entire country is effect, affected. Well. The stock market crash immediately led to what's called a run on the banks. People ran to the banks to get money out. We'll talk about that in just a moment. <clears throat> this is a cartoon from the time. Uh, this is from 1929. And it says the stock market, the ride, and he, the stock market here is portrayed as a roller coaster at an amusement park. It's going up and down. Oh, it was a lot of fun. But as you can see in the middle, it goes up, 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 and then it just ends and people go falling down. 
Now this is a photo of a savings bank in the Midwest with people lined up at the doors. And this happened throughout the United States and that's called a run on the bank. So what happened? People went to the bank to get their money, all of it or some of it out. Well, let's just assume that someone had $500 in the bank and $500 at that time was a good sum of money for a middle class family. They went to the bank and they had a little bank book that showed their amount. Well, the bank didn't have the money to pay all these people in line. Because as you know, when, for instance, a savings bank, when someone deposits the money, the bank just doesn't leave it in its vault. No. How does it make money? It lends that money out to someone um, to buy a home, to buy a car, uh, or lends it out to a company for investment. So let's assume these people um, had money in the bank and they were receiving 3% a year interest on their savings. Well, the bank would be lending it out at 5 or 6 or 7% a year. Um, and as long as people kept paying the loans back, the bank made money, the depositors made money, and everybody was happy. Now, there's a run on the bank. The banks close their doors. Obviously, that creates panic because people say, my God, where has my money gone? <clears throat> this is a photo, a uh, very graphic photo, a luxury automobile. A wealthy person sent, uh, sell this for $100, must have cash, lost all on the stock market. And economists disagree somewhat as to when the great economic recession began exactly, but clearly months and months before the September 1929 stock market crash. And as I mentioned before, it was caused by underconsumption by consumers and overproduction at the factories. The consumers simply did not have access to sufficient credit or cash to, to purchase the many products. Now, in 1932, there was 25% unemployment in the country. And from 1929 to 1933, the first four years of the recession, the gross domestic product fell over one quarter by 27%. Now, the economy was also hurt by high tariffs on you know, foreign imports. The idea was to um, protect American companies by keeping out other products. And most noteworthy in this regard is the Smoot-Hawley Tariff of 1930. There's more information of this in the textbook. And this is often cited by economists in the last 50 years as a classic example of what not should be done in such conditions. And so what happened when the United States applied tariffs to keep foreign products out? Well, other countries retaliated. They imposed tariffs, very high tariffs, to keep American products out, which hurt the, the, the American um, companies and their workers. And this is called beggar thy neighbor policy. In trade policy, last 50 years, people often talk about the problem of retaliation and to, to try and hurt other countries to help your own country. I have here the relevance today. Well, there's been a significant move since World War II um, in the multilateral institutions such as the World Trade Organization to greatly, greatly reduce tariffs and to prevent this sort of retaliation. And at the same time, the Federal Reserve Bank um, reduced the money supply with what's called a tight mon monetary policy. Most economists today would disagree with this and say that you know the Federal Reserve should loosen the money monetary policy by, in effect, increasing the money supply. Um, and I'm sure you learn in economics how they do this through reserve requirements and other measures with uh, banks around the country. But 
uh, they, they did just the opposite with a tight monetary policy. Now, the European countries were also hard hit with the Great Recession. They started to recover in the late 1920s, but they started importing fewer U.S. products because the United States had put up prohibitive tariffs to keep their European products out. This is the good graph of the U.S. unemployment rate. Uh, this graph is from 1930 to 2008. And you can see there in the 1930s, the average unemployment rate was 17%. And it peaked in the early 1930s and then lowered somewhat through federal government programs we'll see in a few minutes. And then if you just look during World War II, it goes down significantly. And then it only slightly goes above 10% in the 1980s. And we'll talk later in the course about uh, what happened after 2008. Now, we've just seen these statistics, but we have to look at the human side of it. One quarter of the people in the United States could not afford housing or adequate food. 40% of home mortgages went into default, almost one half. Many, many farmers became bankrupt with the low prices they could receive for their products. And there was a real mood across the country of despair, submission, which is quite understandable. And in fact, at this point, about 1% of Americans joined the Communist Party of the United States, which is the highest uh, membership the Communist Party has ever had. And by the way, the Communist Party is still legal in the United States, and in many states, when you cast your ballot um, for president of the United States in an election, there is someone from the American Communist Party um, running. They don't receive many votes, but they still are on the ballot. And soup kitchens were set up by churches, civic groups, which was initially, before the government got particularly involved, we'll see in a few minutes, this was a traditional way to deal with um, economic depressions were largely churches and um, labor unions and others setting up things like soup kitchens. And sort of what became really iconic uh, were people selling apples on corners uh, in cities. We'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then people without jobs were called hobos and they went to went on roads, they would jump on trains, they, they didn't have any money, they'd jump on freight trains, hoping to find work uh, in another city or a farm or something. Uh, this is a photo of a former wealthy businessman. He and his family live in this little hut they constructed because they lost their home um, out. Um, and you can see it was a park, you can see the nice little pathways there with the painted white rocks. This was like a city park and people moved in there. Here we have a, a man with a nice coat, a nice hat. Clearly he was fairly well off and he's selling apples for five cents each. This is again sort of iconic of the depression, people selling apples on the street corner. Why were they selling apples? Well, it was a great marketing move by the apple growers. It just so happened, just by coincidence, as the Depression was starting, they had a bumper crop in Washington State. If you're not familiar with the term bumper crop, it means great excess in production. The weather was just perfect. The rain was, the rain, the sun, everything was perfect. And so they had more apples they knew what to do with. So the growers didn't know what to do, so they came up with this idea. They would sell the apples cheaply to the unemployed with the idea the unemployed would resell them. And so we just saw in the previous photo apples for five cents. The unemployed would normally buy these for two or three cents and then sell them and you know, pocket the difference. <clears throat> 
So who, Herbert Hoover was elected president in the election in November 1928, and he entered office in early 1929. It was actually in March 1929. Um, now our presidents are inaugurated in January, but there was in the next decade a constitutional amendment to change the inauguration date from March until January. Herbert Hoover was well known in the United States. He was a very, very famous engineer, and he prided himself on his efficiency. And in fact, at the end of World War I, when there was massive, massive hunger in Europe, he managed the entire food relief effort in Europe and was a great success. And many, many hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of people did not starve to death thanks to his great managerial capabilities. So he was elected by the Republican, he was a Republican president. Um, now, Hoover th thought he wanted the economy to cure by itself. This is what had been done in the past. There had been little to no action by the national government. People viewed economic recessions as just part of the business cycle going up and down. And then when it was clear that that wasn't going to work in this case, that it was prolonged, it was such a deep recession, he actually took unprecedented action by the federal government. And by unprecedented, I underlined the word, no president previously in U.S. history had taken such significant action to counter an economic recession. As we will see, it turned out not to be enough, and some of it was um, counterproductive. But he didn't just sit by and do nothing. Um, he did take great action. And of course, then much, much more was done by his successor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as we'll see in great detail. Well, the first thing he did when he, he Hoover, realized that this was not going to take care of itself is he in, had meetings at the White House with business leaders, labor union leaders, and agricultural leaders to try and figure out what to do. Now, Hoover himself insisted, and this was many... Um, people in the Republican Party thought the best thing to do was to balance the federal government by increasing taxes. Well, this turned out to be exactly the wrong action to take at the time because what happens when people's taxes are increased? They have less money to spend on purchases, and that means the factories produce less. They have to let, let go of more workers or the factories close. Um, and so most economists today would say what should be done is increasing government spending and not dramatically increasing taxes. Now, Shan there became, it became widespread disenchantment with Hoover that he wasn't doing enough. It was too late. Most people had no idea what needed to be done, but it was clear the situation was getting worse. So the shanty towns where the poor people lived were called Hoovervilles, and people in these shanty towns often didn't have blankets, particularly in the north, it's very cold. Uh, so they used piles of newspapers um, as blankets, and they called those Hoover blankets. This is a photo of a Hooverville. In the foreground, you can see all the little shacks that had been constructed out of whatever material people could find, people who'd lost their homes because they couldn't pay the mortgage or the rent. We saw this photo previously. Um, this is a man, and he was formerly a business executive. Um, and this is a good example of what a Hoover blanket is. He's reading the newspaper, and then he'll keep it. You know, you know newspaper's probably a few days old, been thrown away by someone who had money, and inside he has a stack that he and his family will use as blankets. Now, Herbert Hoover believed that it was simply wrong for the government to provide direct support for the poor. He said that was socialism. And like people in the past, he thought charity alone would be sufficient. Now, Herbert Hoover lost most of his support 
or much of his support. In 1932, early in the year, and this was <coughs> before the presidential election, a large group of unemployed army veterans. Now, these were veterans who had actually gone to Europe in World War I as part of the American Expeditionary Force. They were without work, and they went to Washington, D.C. and camped out, and they demanded their bonuses. Now, these bonuses had been promised in the, the late 1930s, you know, 20 years after they came back from World War I. But people said, I can't wait another six or seven years for my bonus. I want it now. And they went there and they demonstrated peacefully. Well, Hoover instructed the U.S. Army and to go in and force out the bonus army. And many of the people had brought uh, their families. Here's a photo of uh, the bonus army being evicted. Um, he also asked for cooperation from local police forces, which helped. Now this action led to widespread negative news coverage by the newspapers at the time. And people viewed Hoover and by extension, the Republicans as heartless. These were after all, people who had fought for the United States in World War I. They had been promised these bonuses. It wasn't going to be that year. It was going to be um, a number of years later, but they were unemployed and they had showed up with their family. These certainly were not sort of East European anarchists who were out uh, causing trouble. And from this point on, Hoover's speeches, you know, people listened to him. He came across as very cold and just not really caring for the unemployed and homeless. Uh, from what I've read, he did really care about the unemployed and homeless, but his style was, you know, by professionally, he was an engineer. He would just give speeches, citing a lot of statistics. And he just did not project his care for the unemployed and the homeless. Um, the lecture will be continued on the second part. Thank you.